St. Elias Ashmole. Um, I got interested in Elias Ashmole uh, back when I was in law school. I sort of took him as a, a patron saint during my, uh, my time in law school. So uh, I would have a, I basically made a little holy card of a picture of him and I carried it around with me in my backpack everywhere and uh, took it out and would have it in front of me when I was studying. Um, while Hadji Olatree is not really much of an EGC thing, at least not officially, and I don't know of a lot of people that do it, I, I confess that I've indulged in it over the years and, uh, you know, taken uh, some of our saints and, and used them uh, certainly for inspiration uh, and companions in certain parts of my life. And for my time in law school, it seemed that there would be no better companion than uh, St. Elias Ashmole, who happened to be a lawyer himself. So, like I said, I, I printed out this little card and carried it around with me everywhere and had him next to me when I was studying. Uh, and he was a constant companion you know, for my time in law school. And interestingly, it so happened that after I graduated, I graduated, you know, in May, uh, we went down or went up to England to go to a wedding. Now, I had nothing to do with that. I just was along for the ride. And it just so happened that that wedding was in Litchfield, where Elias Ashmole was born, uh, where he served as a choir master, as we'll see later on. And I and so I got to go to Elias Ashmole's house. I got to go to the cathedral where he served as a choir master. I got to thank this, this man who had been an inspiration to me for the previous several years. And I've always really marveled at the way that sort of devotion can lead you in those ways. It, had, it hadn't entered my mind that I would be in England at his house when I first selected him as an inspiration uh, for my work in law school, but, you know, you're, uh, do what thou wilt should be the whole law, right? So my, I uh, set in force, a court, uh, in, in course, a current of will that ultimately manifested not only in graduating from law school, but also in actually going to this, this gentleman's house. And that always has really stuck with me. So let me tell you a little bit about, uh, Brother Ashmole's history before we kind of uh, get into why he is important to us as uh, Gnostic Thelemites. Elias Ashmole was born in Bread Market Street in Litchfield, and uh, you can see here, this is the house he was born in. It currently has a plaque that says, it is the birthplace of Elias Ashmole, Windsor Herald to Charles II founder of the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford. Uh, as you see there on the plaque, he was born on May 23rd of 1617 uh, and died in 1692. Between those two years was a really, really remarkable life. So to kind of set the stage a little bit, let's think about where we were in, in England at the time. Queen Elizabeth had died in 1603. John Dee, who we'll see was one of Ashmole's heroes, uh, died in 1608. So at the death of Queen Elizabeth in 1603, she was succeeded to the English throne by James VI of Scotland, who became James I of England. Uh, his son was Charles I, the ill-fated uh, king who was executed by Parliament. So Ashmole's life played out against the background of the English Civil War and the rise of the uh, scientific revolution. And so as I, as I sort of said in the blurb, and I'll just kind of read the blurb uh, from the uh, talk I'm giving tonight, because I think it gives a good summary of what we're looking to establish through this presentation. That Ashmole bridged the divide between the Elizabethan Rosicrucianism of John Dee and Robert Flood and the Masonic Illuminism of the Restoration. Ashmole lived many lives as an astrologer, as an alchemist, as a soldier and a lawyer, as a Freemason and a scientist at the dawn of the Enlightenment. And so we're gonna look at all of this and see what, how his contributions have lived on in the Ashmolean Museum, uh, in the continuance of our knowledge of John Dee's Enochian system and in other ways. <laughs> 
There we go. This is Litchfield Cathedral. So uh, we saw pictures of where Ashmole was born. This is where he served as uh, the choir master. And this is a, a really beautiful cathedral. You can see it's very big. You, there's a big plane around it. So it sort of really sits out and you can see it from a long way away. It's a, it's a really remarkable building. And this is where, you know, Litchfield would have, or where uh, Ashmole would have been baptized, where he would have gone to church, been a part uh, a participant in the choir and ultimately became the choir master. So uh, looking over some of the events in Ashmole's life, after he sort of grew up a little bit, uh, he moved to London uh, to be a tutor. Now, when we say he grew up, he was, I think, like 15 or something like that, right? So 1633, what was that? Uh, yeah, 15 years old. He uh, was qualified to be a tutor. Uh, so he moved to London in 1638. He became a solicitor. So just five years later, a, a, a 20 year old became a solicitor, began his law practice. In 1642, the English Civil War begins. In 1644, Ashmole was appointed as the King's Commissioner of Excise at Litchfield. So he had to leave London, go back to Litchfield uh, to serve his king. In 1645, Ashmole was appointed the King's Commissioner of the Excise at. Uh, uh, Worcester. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I forgot how to say the word. In 1646, Litchfield was sacked by parliamentary forces and the cathedral was, pandal uh, was vandalized. Uh, notably, Ashmole you know, ran in and saved a bunch of music books from being burned that now that act is credited with preserving uh, a great deal of music from that time period that would otherwise have been lost. So, you know, even apart from his later antiquarian uh, and spiritual studies, Ashmole was already preserving the past for those of us who came later uh, by, you know, and I imagine in my head, he's probably wearing, you know, his full gown. He goes running in with flames around him and grabbing these, these books. He probably left a couple of children crying in a corner or something and ran out with these books. Uh, but, but we were indebted to him for saving, you know, this music. Things went south, of course, for uh, the royals in the English Civil War, and King Charles I was beheaded. Uh, Charles II was proclaimed king of England, but he was, of course, a king in exile. In 1651 uh, is when Charles actually goes into uh, exile, and the parliament under Oliver Cromwell takes over uh, to govern England. In 58, Cromwell dies, and you have the restoration where Charles II is restored uh, to rulership over the kingdom. In 1660, Ashmole first meets Charles and is appointed the Windsor Herald. And of course, as we saw in the uh, opening uh, slide, there's the plaque that, that announces uh, his appointment to that position. In 1661, Ashmole was named a fellow of the Royal Society, which we will discuss in more detail later on. Uh, in February of 1661, uh, he's named the Secretary of Suriname, which was uh, a province uh, in the West Indies that uh, he theoretically was supposed to gain an income from, but apparently wasn't a very wealthy property, so he didn't get much out of it, I'm afraid. Uh, April 24, 1661, the restoration is accomplished, and uh, in 1669, Ashmole is made a doctor of medicine at Oxford, and finally, May 18, 1692, after a long life, Ashmole dies at Lambeth, Surrey. Here is a photograph of St. Mary's Church, where Ashmole is currently buried, as well as uh, the same church in a contemporary picture from uh, from Ashmole's time period. So you can see it's it's very much the same. So the first thing we're going to talk about with Ashmole is Ashmole's involvement in Freemasonry. Ashmole uh, was made a Freemason at Warrington in Lancashire in 
uh, with a gentleman named uh, Colonel Henry Manwaring uh, of Carincham, also in Cheshire. Um, in his journal, he lists, and you can see there is Carincham and Cheshire. He also names the other individuals who were initiated with him. Uh, this notation is commonly recognized to be the first uh, record of an initiation into speculative Freemasonry. I think this is nearly 70 years before the establishment of United uh, Grand Lodge of England in 1717. So this is really early. Um, at the time, there would not have been a master's degree. You were just made a companion or a fellow of the craft. So this is a really important document for us. And as you can see here, this is from October 16th of 1646. Now, it's also perhaps relevant to note that Ashmole's fellow candidate, Henry Manwaring, uh, was a parliamentarian and was in opposition to Ashmole's own devotion to the crown. But they stood together as brothers in the confines of the lodge. And this, of course, is a, a time-honored Masonic uh, tradition of there being no distinctions based on religion or politics within the lodge and is certainly a lesson for our own time and, and indeed our own fraternity. In March 10th of 1682, right? So we're, we're jumping now from the 1640s all the way to the 1680s because throughout that time, it appears that Asheville continued to be active in uh, Freemasonry throughout his life. So we sort of look at some of the folks, you know, the founding fathers of uh, the U.S. who were Masons. Sometimes uh, those brothers were interested in Masonry for a short time, or they fell away later in life, or uh, maybe they only became a Freemason later in life, whatever the case may be. But, but you can see here we're talking about a man who was uh, devoted to the craft for a very, very long time. Uh, and he said in his records, his, his journal on March 10th, that he received a summons to appear at a lodge to be held the next day at Mason's Hall, London. Accordingly, I went and about noon were admitted into that fellowship of Freemasons. And then he lists uh, a number of individuals as well as listing all the, the folks who attended the initiation and says, I was the senior fellow among them, it being 35 years since I was admitted. We all dined at the Half Moon Tavern in Cheapside at a noble dinner prepared at the charge of the new accepted Masons. So uh, we're still talking about exception, you know, uh, of Masons at that time, as, as much as initiation, which is, again, kind of interesting. We're still, you know, pre-Master uh, Mason, pre-Grand Lodge of England. So some of these early records and references to how these ceremonies were carried out or terminology that was used, very valuable for uh, later historians. Apparently, in addition to all of this, Ashmole had prepared or had been working on a history of Freemasonry. And again, we're thinking before Grand Lodge of England was even founded, so what was he making a history of? Well, uh, when a Dr. Knipe of Christchurch went through uh, Ashmole's papers after his death, uh, he wrote a letter to uh, a correspondent in which he said the following. And, and this information was taken from, uh, from Ashmole's uh, researches and gives you an idea of the sort of uh, lines of inquiry that Ashmole was uh, pursuing. Quote, St. Alban, the proto-martyr of England, established masonry here, and from his time it flourished more or less, according as the world went, down to the days of King Athelstan, who, for the sake of his brother Edwin, granted the masons a charter under Norman princes. I shall note that the masons were always loyal, which exposed them in, to great severities when power wore the trappings of justice. I really love that phrase. Uh, and those who committed treason punished true men as traitors. Thus, in the third year of the reign of Henry VI, an act of parliament was passed to abolish the Society of Masons and to hinder, under grievous penalties, the holding of chapters, lodges, and other regular assemblies. Yet this act was afterwards repealed, and even before that, King Henry VI and several of the principal lords of his court became fellows of the craft. So we can see a mixture of, uh, of mythologizing, right, that St. Albans brought in Freemasonry, 
uh, that this was going on at the time of the Norman Conquest and that this tradition was passed down, you know, through Henry VI, uh, that it was later abolished where through an act of parliament, which um, I will confess I didn't go try to look up, but there was actually an act of parliament abolishing uh, masonry around that time. But again, you can sort of see how there's a, uh, an mythologizing that was going on as well as uh, an appeal to actual history which is something that is a, a time-honored tradition in masonry and really in, in fraternal orders of, of various kinds uh, all through the ages. So this was uh, Ashmole's contribution to us as a mason, right? We have, he provided to us very early records of Masonic initiation. He allowed us to identify other uh, members of the craft who he was contemporaneous with. Uh, he also was attempting to uh, research and compile materials on the history of the craft, even as he understood it, uh, you know, in the, in the mid 1600s. So a really interesting document. But Brother Ashmole's contributions to us as esotericists did not stop with Freemasonry. He was also uh, a major contributor to uh, al alchemical collections as well. Uh, the 1650s were a really intense period of alchemical activity for Ashmole. Um, it sort of begins with uh, a question that he posed, because he was also an astrologer, and so he posed a horary question uh, on May 20th of 1650, quote, whether I shall ever have the philosopher capstone or whether the matter and fire I think of be true. So as early as May of 1650, he was deeply concerned with alchemical uh, research and uh, was anxious whether he himself would, would find the philosopher's stone. During the 1650s, he published three works on alchemy, uh, one under a pseudonym and two under his own name. Uh, all three of these uh, carry the same characterization of himself as Mercuriophilius Anglicus, the English Mercury lover. In, let's see, uh, in 1650, he published the Fasciculus uh, Chemicus, or the Chemical Collections, which was the, uh, the previous slide. Uh, it was published under the pseudonym of James Hassel, which is an anagram of Elias Ashmole. Uh, it's an anthology of chemical writings, particularly by Arthur D., the son of John D. Uh, John D. or Arthur D. had written these uh, texts in Latin. Ashmole created an English translation of these Latin texts and published them. It was originally written or, or published without these. Uh, permission because Ashmole believed that D had passed, but it turned out that uh, Arthur D was actually very much alive at the time. And once he discovered that D uh, had just been out of the country, he went ahead and wrote to Arthur D and apologized and said, Hey, I didn't know you were still alive. I published these English translations of your work. I hope you're okay with that. Uh, of course, you know, Copyright wasn't really a problem back then, but uh, I'm sure he wanted to stay on, on the good side of the son of his hero. Well, Dee apparently didn't really approve these translations. He wrote back to Ashmole. He was courteous, but he said, I'm sorry you or any man should take pains to translate any book of that art into English, for the art is vilified so much already by scholars that be advanced by the vulgar. So Ashmole was somewhat chastened, but their correspondence continued uh, it, it, uh, through the next year. Unfortunately, uh, Arthur D. died in uh, the year following Ashmole getting to correspond with him, which must have been extremely disappointing to Ashmole. But uh, so between the publication of chemical collections and the next book we'll talk about, he, uh, Ashmole received a, a spiritual initiation or an adoption uh, by another alchemist. He, in April 3rd of 1651, 
he was adopted as the spiritual son and heir of an esotericist by the name of William Backhouse, uh, who lived in Swallowfield in Berkshire. Uh, and as he quoted in his ever helpful journals, quote, Mr. William Backhouse of Swallowfield in Berkshire caused me to call him father thenceforward and became uh, the or, uh, Ashmole's teacher in alchemy. In 1652, Ashmole published the second of his trinity of alchemical publications and probably the one that most folks are familiar with in some ways his uh, magnum opus the Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum uh, which was an anthology of English masons uh, and of course Theatrum Chemicum Britannicum translates as the theater of British chemistry this is actually a picture of my own beloved copy of this uh, that Aroboros Press did uh, a number of years ago it's a really, really beautiful book. And as, like I said, it's Ashmole's most widely known alchemical work. Uh, it's an anthology of English alchemists in particular, including uh, Thomas Norton's The Ordinal of Alchemy, as well as works by George Ripley, Edward Kelly, John Dee, and he even threw in Chaucer's Tale of the Canon's Yeoman uh, for good measure, because there's a story about alchemy in there. Uh, on May 30th, 1653, Ashmole records that Backhouse taught him the secret to the Philosopher's Stone while Backhouse was, quote, lying sick in Fleet Street over at Five Dunstan's Church and not knowing whether he should live or die. So in the Rosicrucian tradition, he, uh, Backhouse did not want to fail of an heir, so fearing that he was at death's door, uh, communicated his secret to Ashmole. Uh, Backhouse, however, apparently recovered after this and, and lived on. So whether he regretted sharing that with <laughs> Ashmole at that time, uh, Ashmole does not record. After uh, the Teatrum Chemicum Britannicum, Ashmole published The Way to Bliss. Now, this was Ashmole's final alchemical publication. Uh, it was an anonymous manuscript that he had discovered in the library of William Backhouse. Um, Ashmole takes pot shots in the introduction at, quote, the wise man's crown or Rosicrucian physic of Eugenius Theodidacticus as, quote, a mutilated version of the manuscript. The reference here is actually to two separate works, the wise man's crown or glory of the rosy cross and a new method of Rosicrucian physic. Uh, the author, Mr., whose uh, name was Hayden, uh, was himself apparently a fairly irascible fellow uh, who was imprisoned in the Tower of London twice, and he returned the favor, accusing Ashmole of stealing his work. So this was an early version of the, the sort of uh, taking pot shots at each other in print that we later on see amongst people like Arthur Waite uh, and Crowley and John Yarker and <laughs> various other people that, that we may be more familiar with their printed work. And as we today see on Facebook and elsewhere. Uh, so here was John Hayden's uh, two books, uh, The Wise Man's Crown, as well as A New Method of Rosicrucian Physics. Okay, so we're going to move on now. We, we've touched on Crowley's, hey, Crowley, wow, you see who lives in my head the most. We've touched on Ashmole's uh, Freemasonic career. We've touched on his alchemical career, and now we're going to turn to his contributions to the foundation of perhaps the, the most famous scientific uh, fraternity in the Western world, the Royal Society. Now, on January 2nd of 1661, Ashmole was elected a fellow of the Royal Society. This was quite a feat because that society had really just, uh, was just in its most nascent stage. If you're not familiar with the Royal Society, uh, their webpage explains them to have been. And this, I think this is really interesting given uh, our, our concerns here. Our origins lie in a 1660 invisible college of natural philosophers and physicians. Today, we are the UK's National Science Academy and a fellowship of some 1600 of the world's most eminent scientists. So from, and we say humble beginnings, uh, but as you'll see here, the founding members included the architect of London, Christopher Wren, uh, as well as Robert Boyle, uh, 
uh, whose Boyle law describes how the pressure of a gas tends to increase uh, as the volume of a container decreases. And these are all things we probably learned in, in high school science class. Uh, if you've ever been to London and taken a red bus tour, you've heard the name Christopher Wren about a thousand times because he practically built uh, London after uh, the Great Fire in 1666. So these are really eminent people, and Elias Ashmole was was right in the thick of them and involved in the foundation of you know their hopes and dreams for a royal society. Before the society was uh, even named, their their first meeting was pegged at November 28th of 1660, which Ashmole attended, and again the following year he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society. Uh, I believe he was in the first class to have done so. In addition to this, uh, Ashmole also published a book called The Institutions, Laws, and Ceremonies of the Most Noble Order of the Garter. And for those uh, without interest in, in esoteric pursuits, such as ourselves, uh, it's probably the book for which he is uh, best known. And it was dedicated to the most high, most excellent, and most mighty monarch, Charles II, by the grace of God, King of Great Britain, France, and Ireland, defender of the faith, and sovereign of the most noble order of the Garter. Uh, the purpose of the work was to restore the image of the Order of the Garter in the spirit of the Restoration, uh, but Ashmole had been collecting uh, materials on the Order since at least the 1650s. Uh, he was actually proposed to become a uh, member of the Order of the Garter, uh, but there was some internal finagling and ultimately his uh, hopes were disappointed and rather than be voted down, he withdrew uh, his name from consideration. Uh, Tobias Churton, who by the way, um, a, a great part of the information I have here uh, was taken from uh, Tobias Churton's Magus of Freemasonry. If you have not read that book, I highly recommend it. Uh, but he goes into into detail as to you know who was involved in in undermining Ashmole, and uh, although the reasons why are actually sort of a mystery even today. But he was making a name for himself as a scholar uh, of history and of uh, the peerage, as well as being involved in the Royal Society, as well as being a scholar of alchemy and a practitioner of Freemasonry, and that. It would be enough for any man, but it was not enough for Elias Ashmole. In 1639 or 59, John Tradescant the Younger deeded his cabinet of curiosities to Ashmole. We see here uh, the two John Tradescants, both the elder and the younger. Um, they were collectors. Um, so it was very fashionable at the time. You got to think this is before the rise of the public museum. The gentlemen simply collected stuff. You know, um, it was natural history, unusual rocks, right? Geology history, ethnography, archaeology, religious and historical studies, uh, works of art, you know, relics. Uh, this continued on in many ways into uh, even after the the advent of the earliest museums and even into the 19th century. And I think, you know, we think about like the Victorian study with the, the odd curios, that was sort of a later uh, survival of these early uh, curio cabinets that were coming up around this time. They started uh, as a fad in the 16th century and were prominent until, again, the late 18th century. This particular collection had uh, been amassed by uh, the elder and younger Tradescants. And they had both been royal gardeners. So they had served their king not only by keeping up with gardens, but by uh, touring the New World and bringing back uh, novel plant species from the New World. And that's something I think it's, it's also easy for us to, you know, now our world is so, uh, so interconnected that you know, hard, it, 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 it's hard for us to think about how powerful and revolutionary some of the things that just a gardener going to the uh to the caribbean islands and bringing back certain plants that hadn't been seen in uh in europe before how powerful that could be um the british museum has 
a scrying mirror in its collection of John Dee materials that is believed to have been uh, brought to, uh, or that Ashmole, that, I say Ashmole, that John Dee had uh, acquired uh, somehow that was originated from uh, the New World, like from Central America. So even as far back as John Dee, you know, that impact of, of the goods of the New World were flowing into England and transforming the ways people thought about their world. Um, so the Traviscans, as I said, served as gardeners. They brought back a bunch of cool plants and they established a, a museum called Museum Tradescantium. And it was the first public museum in England and it contained both natural and man-made curiosities. Now, Ashmole had worked with Tradescant the Younger uh, to catalog his collection in uh, 1656. And that included providing monetary support uh, to you know, keep the museum going. Uh, when, when John Tradescant the Younger died, Ashmole acquired that collection. And then he, in turn, uh, donated his collection, including the Tradescant materials, to the Oxford University in 1677. So the first Ashmolean Museum was built between 1679 and 1682 and opened to the public in 1683. This is, uh, again, a picture of the old Ashmolean building uh, from contemporary times, as well as what would have been a period illustration of the museum. So the current museum is this, a little bit fancier. Uh, it was built between 1679, or I'm sorry, in a, uh, built in the early 1840s and was opened in 1845. Again, you have a contemporary pic picture as well as a picture from uh, the 1840s. So this became the Ashmolean Museum. You Google the Ashmolean Museum and you can still locate this today. Um, there have been some attempts in the intervening years to minimize Ashmole's contribution to the museum. In this line of thought, Ashmole had really done nothing more than take credit for the Tradescant's collection. Um, Tobias Churton, uh, as I referenced earlier, uh, had a quote to combat this tendency. He wrote, Ashmole was magisterially involved in the establishment, detailed regulation, and underlying philosophy of the museum, end quote. In truth, Ashmole's correspondence at the time demonstrates that he made no attempt to hide the source of his collection, and he even referred to the objects he donated as John Tradescant's rarities. So he wasn't trying to steal anybody's valor. These things came into his, his possession. He later donated them, uh, and the museum was named after him. Uh, now, Ashmole's own museum, uh, uh, contribution to the museum was somewhat limited, but this was largely because he himself had suffered a fire at his home in 1679. That fire had destroyed his library and his collection of nearly 9,000 coins and medals. He lost examples of uh, the great seals of England from the time of the Norman Conquest, and all of his research, or most of his research into antiquities almost were, also went up in flames. So, uh, there was an incredible wealth of material that Ashmole was in possession of that were lost to the fires and uh, we're all the poorer for it, I think. And, and so when we have material such as I quoted earlier about his uh, Masonic research, the fact that any of that still survives is, is uh, really remarkable. So the final area uh, where Ashmole contributed to uh, posterity that, that we'll address here tonight is in the realm of Enochiana. So we talked earlier about how Ashmole had been in a brief correspondence with Arthur D. Uh, Arthur died in October 1651. Nearly 22 years later, Ashmole established a different connection to the legacy of John D. He wrote in his diary on the 20th of August, or, well, I'll let him tell it. Be it remembered, Ashmole wrote, that 20th of August, 1672, I received by the hands of my servant Samuel Story a part of Dr. D's manuscripts, all written with his own hand, viz. his conference with Angelo, 
which first began the 22nd of December, anno 1581, and continued to the end of May, anno 1583, where the printed book of the remaining conferences published by Dr. Casabon begins and are bound up in this volume. He goes on to describe the materials. He says, the book entitled De Heptarchia Mystica Collectanorum, uh, Liber Primus, and a book of invocations or calls beginning with the squares filled with letters about the Black Cross. These four books I have bound up in another volume, all of which were a few days before delivered to my said servant for my perusal by my good friend, Mr. Thomas Whale, one of his majesty's wardens in the Tower of London. So, and, and we'll, we'll see the story here in a second, but you can imagine, you know, for, for Ashmol, who had lionized D for his, you know, most of his life, to suddenly have these unknown D papers drop into his lap towards the end of his life must have been just, you know, really uh, overwhelming to him. And the story that led to him receiving those papers is also really fascinating. So this, this uh, friend of his, Thomas Weyer, uh, Whale, uh, was married, and his wife had previously been married to a Mr. Jones. During that marriage, they had bought a chest from a furniture sale. Uh, Some time around 1662, the Joneses discovered a secret drawer in the chest, and in that drawer was a book, a couple of books, and a rosary. Um, some of the pages were lost because uh, their servant used, and uh, probably most of you who have uh, looked into Enochian history with, uh, with any depth are probably aware that one of uh, the servants of this family had taken some of the pages and used them to line pie tins. So uh, we, uh, we lost some material that way, unfortunately. Uh, and then the chest itself was destroyed in the Great Fire of London in 1666. You know, the fire's just, just, Made up so much of history in the in the modern era, um, but anyway, the surviving pages or the remaining pages managed to survive the fire. Uh, after Mr. Jones's death, the widow remarried Thomas Whale, and she told Whale about these books. You know, she still had them in her possession. Whale took a look at them and said, "Oh, I know a guy that'd want to see these," and he took them over uh, for Elias to take a look at. In October 1672, Ashmole began transcribing the books he received from Whale. He completed that task in August of 1674, so it took him nearly two years to transcribe the D material. Uh, during this period, he had gone so far as to travel to Mortlake, where D had lived, to interview an 82-year-old woman named Widow Faldo, who remembered D from when she was a girl. So. Uh, Ashmole got to go and actually, you know, meet someone who knew Dee and go to Dee's home and, you know, really savor, uh, you know, the atmosphere of where Dee and Kelly began their, their partnership and where, uh, you know, Dee's library and home eventually uh, was scattered to the four winds. The material that Ashmole was able to preserve might otherwise have been entirely lost to us. Uh, as Ashmole note, himself notes, Merrick Casabon's true and faithful relation begins with entries in May of 1583. The Wales trove of documents reached back to December of 1581 and provided otherwise unknown access to almost the entirety of Liber Mysteriorum. So if you have an interest in Enochian magic, you have really John D. Uh, to thank for that. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Uh, I hope you, we, I've been able to demonstrate that uh, Elias Ashmole was a really important figure in his own times, uh, is a participant in history, as well as an individual who helped to preserve history uh, for future generations of which we are now the beneficiaries. And I think his inclusion as a saint in the Gnostic uh, Catholic Church is certainly well justified by both of, uh, of both of these contributions. You know, when you when you look for 
a magician who was devoted to the esoteric arts and also uh, important in his time, Ashmol, like his hero D before him, were certainly shining examples of that. And uh, I think he very much deserved the title that led this presentation, The Gentleman Magician. Thank you so much, brother. Are there, are there any questions at this point? Ah, here's a question. In your opinion, what is it with these moments in history regarding knowledge and understanding being destroyed by fire? <laughs> well, we certainly uh, know that was something that happened uh, in 1904 as well, right? Uh, with the reception of the Book of the Law. I don't know. I, I, I think that... Let, let, me, let me answer a question you didn't ask but, but is related which to me what uh, it, it strikes me is how material survives right like I, I think that the angels have their own agenda that i think they have their own ways and so it would have been very easy for all of that material to have been lost to history and instead by this strange series of coincidences uh we managed to recover you know liber mysteriorum even if a few pages got lost in, uh, under a cherry pie or, or what have you or probably a kidney pie, I guess, in, in England back then. Um, we can look to it like the manuscript of the Book of the Law. It disappears, nobody knows where it is, and then suddenly some guy just finds it in his basement, you know? Um, just happens to find somebody who knows somebody that knows Israel Regardi or what have you. So, you, you know, you start to get those sorts of connections where I, I think that, that there are um, forces that take care of their own, you know? And, and so... I like to think that when the fire comes, it cleanses the inessential and leaves us what's important. Well, I believe, uh, it, I may be paraphrasing, but Mikhail Bulgakov and Master and Margarita famously said that manuscripts never burn. They always persist spiritually in some way. Nice. Another question. What do you think was communicated to Ashmole about the secret of the Philosopher's Stone? <laughs> well, if I knew that. Uh, I wouldn't be sitting here. Oh, really? <laughs> Leave us in the cold? Unless, uh, unless you see me suddenly looking like I'm 25 with my long, beautiful hair again, I, I, I don't think I have the answer to the philosophy. I, I didn't ask how old you were at the top, so. <laughs> you never ask a lady uh, his age or something. So you, you, you have no... No, I, I really, I, I don't know. Um, I, I will say this, that if you have not perused uh, the, the uh, Teatrum Chemicum Britannicum, uh, really, it, it is a, a very worthy uh, collection of, of materials. And so, like, there's the, um, uh, start making me get up and grab books. Well, you know, it wouldn't be a presentation of the Education Committee if you didn't cite at least three books that people will want to buy. By the way, as long as I'm doing that, well. let, me, let me plug uh, the Churton book, too. Okay. So the, I guess the two biggest anthologies of alchemical work I have are the Hermetic Museum that was compiled by Waite and then uh, Ashmole's book. And there's actually not a lot of overlap. So you can, both of these books together will give you a ton of, of alchemical uh, manuscripts without a great deal of overlap. But um, but the Ashmole book is, is certainly um, very, very valuable. Um, some of it is obviously, you know, very chemical, like puffer, uh, practical alchemy oriented. Some of it uh, could be interpreted more as a spiritual alchemy sort of practice. So, um, you know, if you can get a hold of, it doesn't have to be this edition, but, um, but a, a copy of it, I would recommend that, I think. Uh, perhaps you'll find the answers you seek in here. Here's another question. Was astrology similarly vilified like alchemy was at that time? Uh, it was not, actually. Uh, well, I mean, there were always going to be detractors, right? So um, astrology was certainly taken a great deal more seriously now again we're kind of and that's again what's so fascinating about ashmole is that he was just at this sort of tipping point between uh 
the sort of you know the Elizabethan period, which had certainly its own holdovers from medievalism, uh, and, and tipping into this new modern world with the Royal Society and these and these folks who were about chemistry as opposed to alchemy and astronomy as opposed to astrology and you know Giordano Bruno and uh, th those sorts of of ideas of heliocentrism, which of course pre-existed um, the modern world, but had sort of been not commonly accepted. And I think we see the same sort of process happening uh, with astrology at this point. At the same time, astrology was still very much uh, a part of medicine. Uh, it was still you know, widely accepted. Um, let's again, you know, thinking about John D. Uh, John D. was a court astrologer to Queen Elizabeth, and you know, D. and and uh, Queen Elizabeth died what, less than a decade or around a decade before uh, Ashmole was born. So you start to see more of that modern positivistic viewpoint throughout the uh, the 1600s, but there were still certainly you know, serious survivals of that early reliance on those uh, older traditions. Is Ashmole's collection slash compendium available in electronic format? Oh, I, I, I'm sure it probably is. I mean, it, I'm sure Amazon has a, a PDF of, or a, 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 what do you call it, a Kindle format of it. Um, there are, you know, I think, uh, Kessinger probably has a version of it. I think you can still get the standard edition of this from Aurobras Press. And again, this is uh, a really nice edition. Uh, really? That's still available, you think? I, I mean, don't, don't send me any hate mail if it's not, but, but I think it, there's, there may still be some of the standard edition left. You spoke earlier about um, hagiology. Hey and your approach to it. And I had not really heard of that as a concept before, but it is intriguing. Um, if it's not too personal, would you mind describing how you first came to um, approaching that and how you selected Elias Ashmole as, as the saint in question? Well, uh, I, I, um, I was not really raised in a house that was particularly religious at all. So I, I can't, you know, think of, uh, go back to like early religious training one way or the other. Um, but I think like a lot of, probably a lot of esotericists, I've always thought that the, the trappings and regalia of like the Catholic church is really cool. It's just, unfortunately, you know, Catholicism has a lot of stuff in it that, that I'm not interested in. Um, you know, starting with, with, uh, the dying and resurrected God, but, uh, be that as it may, I was always really fascinated by, uh, you know, the little holy cards. And so, and of course, you know, devotion to saints and so forth, it carries down into to modern hoodoo and, and there are various, uh, you know, traditions where saints are, where devotions are carried on uh, to saints. Now, I don't understand, and, and I don't want to at all promulgate the, the idea that I approach uh, the saints and uh, the EGC with the same attitude uh, of like a Catholic saint, right? We don't have this. Well, I, I don't know. I mean, you could, I started to say uh, that we don't have this idea of like this, all these saints die and they go up to heaven and everyone's sitting around and, and uh, uh, you know, singing, singing hymns and everything. But you do have, you know, the communion of saints and this communion of saints is really the idea that there is um, a communion, right? There's a community. There is an, uh, an interaction uh, between a participation with the saints that uh, can be pursued through a ritual format. I think that's the essence of, um, of, saint, of devotion to a saint, regardless of, of the individual trappings. And it's really no different than, than uh, devotion to a god form or to um you know an idea right it, it's just a form of devotion we focus our will on that on that image and uh as with other sorts of, of magical disciplines 
reality is, you know, the idea is that reality will, will sort of take shape in, in response to um, that devotion. And so I guess it, at its most basic, that's where I'm approaching it from. Uh, for me, Ashmole just really fit in with where I was in my life. I was an aspiring uh, uh, lawyer. I was uh, an esotericist. I was a Freemason. And Ashmole sort of embodied all of the, those things for me in a way that was approachable to me. And as a man that, that I found as I read his biography that I really admired. Another question, was Ashmole a pious Christian like Dr. John Dee was? Oh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, of course, it's always funny for me. You think about John Dee in particular, I mean, he could be as pious as he wanted to be, but uh, let's face it, it, you know, Dee was transcribing and transmitting some some really radical ideas that I think, again, are uh, anticipate our own time and the Aeon of Horus in, in really interesting ways. So um, I believe they thought themselves to be pious. I think that um, most of the mainstream believers of their time would believe that most of, the, especially D, that the stuff that he was involved in was, was you know, downright black magic. So yes, it's all your point of view. So in your opinion, what do you think it is specifically about Elias Ashmole that brought him into the pantheon of Gnostic saints? I think it's sort of like I said in the introduction, I, I think he just has a really crucial place in, in the transmission of the esoteric current. You know, one thing that I actually didn't address in in the presentation and would be hesitant to try to like rattle off a whole bunch of facts about because I, I haven't really thought about this in a while, but Ashmole was not explicitly a Rosicrucian, right? You like you don't you don't see a lot of of um connection to Ashmole with that word, right? Like he's not necessarily thought of as a Rosicrucian type figure as for example, uh, Michael Meyer would have been, or Robert Flood would have been, uh, you know, in the decades before him, or, uh, or, or like a Francis Bacon, you know, th those sorts of characters. So, but I, I think he embodies that Rosicrucian spirit, right? He is that connecting link between that, that, Elizabethan Rosicrucianism and how that transformed into the nascent, uh, you know, physical sciences from natural philosophy into physical sciences. And he's a, a sort of link right there between them. And I think that for um, Thelemites, um, you know, it, especially those who are uh, committed to the creed that uh, we practice the method of science but had the aim of religion, that Ashmole sort of embodies those ideas. And again, he was just a really remarkable guy. You know, it, uh, so you take a shining example of a man who helped to preserve and transmit Enochian ideas, uh, to uh, transmit important alchemical ideas, and to form a link in the historical chain. Uh, of, of Rosicrucian ideas, even where maybe that word wasn't bandied about uh, with regard to him that much. Uh, I think those are all reasons why he was really important. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what is meant by speculative masonry? Oh, sure. So you have uh, basically two classes of Freemasonry. You have operative and speculative. Operative masonry is actually taking a rock and squaring it and leveling it and setting it on top of another rock and, and constructing buildings. Speculative masonry is the, um, the use of the processes of operative masonry as metaphors for spiritual purposes. So the sort of general idea, and 
people to this day still debate like where Freemasonry came from and, and uh, you know, was it developed from medieval stone guilds? Was it not developed from medieval stone guilds? Oh, but this guy was from, uh, you know, was, would not have been in a place where he could have been in a stone guild. I, I don't pretend to be a deep, deep scholar of the history of Freemasonry, but in broad strokes, there's the idea that you had these medieval guilds of Freemason, of, of stonemasons. Um, and at some point, for some reason, they began to accept non actual, you know, you, they were they were all the guys that had the stones and the hammers and the chisels. And at some point, for some reason, they began accepting guys into their uh, into their guilds who were not actual masons. They were not stone masons. They were, you know, burghers or they were um, gentry, uh, maybe even, you know, ultimately uh, royalty. Why that happened under what circumstances is not really clear. There aren't records really going back that far. And again, that's one of the reasons that Ashmole's journal entry about his own uh, acceptance into the Masonic uh, fraternity is important because it allows us to date back, you know, to uh, at least to the, you know, 1600s that there were at that time what they called exceptions, you know, uh, non stonemasons being accepted into the craft. Um, so speculative masonry is like today's Freemasons with the uh, with the lodges and uh, the fish fries. That's all speculative masonry. Uh, there are interestingly uh, some folks today who have wanted to go back to the operative craft to better understand uh, their work as as uh, speculative masons. So there are guys out there who become Freemasons and then go off and, and learn how to actually chisel stone just so they'll have a better understanding of their, their spiritual craft as well. I'm not one of those people. These, these hands are too delicate, but uh, there are those folks that do that. How do you think the term or concept of black magic has evolved from John Dee's and Ashmole's time to the present? Well, I think, I mean, in Dee and Ashmole's times, almost it, any magic that was not natural philosophy, you know, was not basically handed down from the Greeks, um, was going to be black magic, right? If you were summoning angels or demons, that was black magic. And in the Christian worldview at the time, there simply was no way to approach uh, conjuring in a way that was not uh, forbidden. I, I think, I hope. I guess that one of the qualities of Thelema of the new Aeon is to, is to undermine that distinction, right? How do we know what's black magic or white magic? Um, I think it, it's going to be situational. I think it's going to be uh, dependent on the will of the individual, right? This is what Crowley teaches us that, um, if you're doing your spiritual pursuits, your magical pursuits should be in furtherance of your will. If you understand your will and you're expressing that will, then any magic you do as a consequence of that should be um, you know, white magic, so to speak. But um, I'm not really a huge fan of, of making that distinction personally. And, and I, I like to think that um, th that's sort of a zeitgeist now maybe in the last decade or so um it's become more the front where people aren't as interested in trying to to put moral judgments upon the tool but to simply pay attention that they use the tool appropriately all right uh, do we have any other questions If not, I would like to thank Brother David for his elucidating and operative lecture on speculative masonry <laughs> and Anarchia as it deals with St. Elias Ashmole. I'd also like to uh, remind everyone that on August 16th, we have Astrological Tarot with Jamie Paul Lamb, another Freemason. Interesting. Suspicious. Well, you know, I'm not going to... Uh, 
get all Leo Taxel on you or anything. <laughs> oh, if only but, it were like that. <laughs> but thank you so much, brother. It's been a pleasure hearing your presentation and hearing the questions from everyone who participated. And uh, it's just a wonderful time. So with that, I will say love is the law, love under will. Thank you from the Education Committee of the OTO, and I will stop recording. <laughs>